In the 1600s in North America, an empire was growing. Bloodthirsty and hungry for resources and land, they pressed their way westward, killing any who stood in their way and refused to assimilate. But they didn't come from across the ocean in sailboats. No, they came from down the river in canoes, from upstate New York, the Iroquois. We all know the story of the European colonization of the Americas. 1492, Chris Columbus, Ocean Blue, blah, 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 genocide, manifest destiny, all that. Fast forward a couple hundred years and that's how my pasty white ass is here, right? Well, kinda. You may be surprised to learn that while it is convenient to summarize 350 years of complex geopolitical relationships, it's slightly more complicated than that. I'm King Trout and whoops, I forgot to check my privilege this morning. Join me as I tell the far too little known but pivotally important story of the Beaver Wars. In the early 1600s, the Iroquois were located in what is now modern day New York. They were a confederacy of at first five, then later six tribes. These tribes had long been at war with each other in what they call the Dark Times until the Great Peace was achieved. Now, since at the time they didn't have a written history, uh, when this happened specifically isn't quite known, but probably sometime between about the year 1000 and the year 1500. The tribes had unified in peace under a complex constitutional system that some say might have influenced the American constitution. And some say didn't, but no one knows, and there's no way of telling, so who cares? Their hobbies included hunting, fishing, light agriculture, being semi-nomadic, and occasionally engaging in warfare with their Algonquian-speaking tribal neighbors. At this same time in the early 1600s, the European powers were starting to make their way over to go check out this newly discovered to them place that they called the New World. The French were the first of these European powers to arrive near the area that the Iroquois inhabited at the time. I can't believe I finally said it. Near the area that the Iroquois inhabited at the time. Two in a row, come on. They established what they called Port Royal in 1605 in what is now modern day Nova Scotia. And a few short years later in 1608, Quebec was founded by Samuel de Champlain. The Dutch arrived shortly after in the region in 1609 when English explorer Henry Hudson on a charter from the Dutch East India Company was sent to explore the region. The Dutch would then establish their first fort in 1614. The English did attempt to establish a colony before these French and Dutch colonies in 1585 with the establishment of the Roanoke Colony, which disappeared and no one knows what happened. The English did establish their first permanent colony at Jamestown in 1607, but that was all the way down in Virginia, nowhere close to the Iroquois, so who cares? It's not relevant to this story. Yet. What did all of these Europeans want when they came over? Well, in 1453, the Ottomans overtook Constantinople and collapsed the Byzantine Empire. Istanbul was Constantinople. Now it's Istanbul, not Constantinople. Been a long time gone since Constantinople. Why did Constantinople get the works? Well, a complicated series of geopolitical and religious reasons dating back thousands of years. But that's all the way over there. What the heck does that have to do with North America? Well, the Ottomans closed the Silk Road to Christians, so Europe was fresh out of all of its spices and silk and beef lo mein. Whatever were they to do? Well, a guy you've probably heard of by the name of Christopher Columbus had an idea. He convinced the king and queen of Spain to sponsor a journey where he would find a new trade route to Asia. Instead of sailing all the way around Africa, he'd just go that way and bump into it from the other side. And it was crazy enough, it just might work. And so in 1492, Christopher Columbus put on his stupid little hat, sailed across the Atlantic until he hit land. He'd made it to Asia. If you were to ask him, that's what he would say anyway. And just for clarification's sake, I'm pretty sure everybody already knows this, but just in case, uh, nobody thought that the earth was flat. It was very well understood that the earth was a sphere. That was the entire premise for the journey directly related to the fact that the Earth is a sphere and everybody knew that. But anyway, he sailed successfully to Asia, if you were to ask him. Yeah, apparently he actually fought people about the fact that he insisted he had made it to Asia. He was successful in his journey, even though other people had then gone to the Americas and come back and they were like, no, that's a completely different place, dude. And a lot of people actually think that uh, the name America from Amerigo Vespucci comes from the fact that Amerigo was one of the first people to recognize like, no, this is a, this is a new place. Nobody's been here yet. Well, no Europeans been here yet, except for the Vikings. It's complicated. You know what I mean? Did Columbus succeed in finding a new trade route to Asia? No, mission failed. But he did find a whole new world full of other fun stuff like coffee and chocolate and tomatoes and gold. 
And after these discoveries, the Portuguese and Spanish began their expansion into these newly discovered lands, plundering and murdering and stealing and coughing all over everything. And they were getting fucking loaded. The other European powers took note of this and decided eh, maybe they want to poke around and find out what's up with this place. The different European nations were going to these newly discovered lands for different reasons. The Spanish and Portuguese were there for gold, glory, and God. So they would steal everybody's sh uh, murder them, uh, or forcibly convert them. That was their MO. The French and Dutch went to this newly discovered land primarily for trade. And at this time, the English found out that they didn't even have to go to the new continent. Uh, they just had privateers steal everybody else's shit while they were shipping it back to Europe. And that worked out pretty good for them for a while. The Dutch and French were trading primarily for animal pelts, and most specifically beaver pelts, a luxury item in Europe where the beaver had nearly been hunted to extinction. It was a status symbol to have usually a hat made out of beaver. I don't know what that looks like, but I'll put a picture up. Editor's note. Um, there wasn't like a specific kind of hat that they made out of these beaver pelts. They just made hats out of them. So imagine really any hat from the 1600s to the 1800s. It was probably made out of beaver pelt. Look at that. I bet it looks stupid, doesn't it? I bet you look fucking stupid. It didn't take the French and Dutch very long to figure out that instead of sending whole crews of men to establish colonies and go out in the woods and hunt for beavers, they could just develop good relationships with the natives who lived in the region, have them do all the legwork, hunt for the beavers, and in exchange they would trade them for, you know, whatever cool European shit they had that the natives wanted. This worked out pretty well. Now, both did have restrictions on trading firearms and gunpowder to the indigenous peoples at this time, you know, just in case. But there were two main tribal groups in this area at the time, the Algonquians and the Iroquois, and they did not get along. The Iroquois realized pretty quickly they could use the Dutch to their advantage. So in 1613, they signed a treaty with the Dutch. Uh, the exchange basically was that they would be trade partners and they would allow for the Dutch to chill on their land. And occasionally, the Dutch would buy plats of their land. Which leads me into a real quick sidebar here. The story of the purchase of the island of Manhattan kept coming up in everything I was reading for a couple of different reasons. One, people seem to treat this story like it's, you know, a scummy European way in which they pulled one over on the indigenous peoples. You know, they traded $60 worth of knickknacks and trinkets for an entire island. Okay, they didn't want the island, it was a hunk of shit to them. So they willingly traded it for $15,000 approximately worth of very useful equipment. Also, a bunch of people for some reason were arguing that the indigenous peoples in this region did not understand the concept of land ownership, which is a fucking insane thing to think. You're talking about groups of people who have been fighting wars over territorial claims for thousands of years and they don't understand that one group of people can hang out on a piece of land while another cannot. That is mind-bogglingly insane to believe to be the case. I have no idea what has to be broken in your brain to think that these people were so dumb, I guess, that, or, you know, so oh, in touch with nature that they didn't understand the concept of land ownership. Everybody understands the fucking concept of land ownership. It's just an inherent, innate thing we all have in us. Shut the fuck up. I'm done with this rant. I'm done with this rant. Back to the video. So this setup worked pretty decently for a little while. The Dutch were trading with their allies in the Iroquois, and the French were trading with their allies, primarily the Algonquians, the enemies of the Iroquois. Everybody was getting what they wanted, you know, the natives were selling off the beaver pelts, they didn't give a shit, they were getting cool things in exchange, the Europeans were getting the beaver pelts they wanted, there was a lot of intermarriage that was happening, everybody was kind of getting along. This worked out for a little while. The first, and by far and a mile, hugest problem huge was that the Europeans had brought diseases with them that the natives had no immunity to. By the 1630s, the native population of the region was basically cut in half. With the populations of two groups of people who had been at war with each other for centuries dwindling, a power vacuum was created. There was another problem. By 1640, the beaver population in Iroquois territory was almost non-existent. They had nearly hunted the beaver to extinction. It's believed that the population of beaver prior to the Dutch arrival was somewhere between a million and two million. And uh, just a few decades later, at this point in time, the population was in the few hundreds. 
The Dutch saw the slowing influx of beaver pelts, along with the fact that there were two long warring tribal factions with dwindling populations in a power vacuum, and had an idea. In 1648, the Dutch lifted the restriction they previously had on trading the Iroquois guns and gunpowder. This is when things really popped off. Immediately afterward, the Iroquois used their newly acquired firepower to begin expanding their territory westward and southward, killing, removing, or assimilating anyone who stood in their way. They began with the Hurons, almost entirely eradicating them, except for those who were willing to assimilate with the Iroquois to replace the population that was dwindling because of disease. Then in 1650 came the Neutral Confederacy, a confederacy of Iroquois who had remained neutral. But wait, the Iroquois were attacking the Iroquois? Yes, Iroquois is just a language group. So is Algonquian. Just broadly speaking, when people say Iroquois, they're referring to these five and later six tribes, even though it's an entire language group. Uh, Algonquian is kind of similar. I could explicitly say the names of each of the tribes, but that would make this video like five hours long, first of all. And second of all, I don't speak any Native American languages, so I'd probably butcher the shit out of it. Like, the name Iroquois isn't even the name they gave themselves. That's the Algonquian name for that group of people. Iroquois comes from the Algonquian word for rattlesnake, which I read in an article written by an Iroquois author as a reference to how stealthy and deadly the Iroquois warriors were, in that they could sneak up, and you wouldn't even know they were there until they sprung out and attacked, like a rattlesnake. Which, maybe, but... Don't you think your mortal enemy would give you a nickname that wasn't intended to be complimentary? Like, just putting this out there. You think maybe the Algonquians called the Iroquois the word for rattlesnake as a reference to the fact that from their perspective, the Iroquois were a deadly pest, like a rattlesnake? Just putting that out there. The Iroquois continued their expansion westward in 1654 when they attacked the Erie tribe. The war lasted for two years, until 1656, when the Erie were finally destroyed. At this same time, the Iroquois were also directly attacking the French, partially because the French were allied with the tribes the Iroquois were enemies of, and also because the French were in direct competition with the Dutch in the fur trade. But the Dutch wouldn't be around for long. In 1664, after the defeat by the British in New Amsterdam, the Dutch left the continent. Even old New York was once New Amsterdam. Why'd they change it? The Second Anglo-Dutch War. Now that the English had taken possession of these Dutch territories, it didn't take very long for them to fill the big empty wooden shoes the Dutch had left behind. Business with the English worked just as well for the Iroquois as it had with the Dutch. They didn't give a shit what country these Europeans were coming from as long as they were buying pelts. The English and Iroquois quickly allied. The Iroquois kept attacking French settlements and disrupting the French fur trade to the extent that the French government recognized something had to be done. In 1664, a thousand soldiers were sent over to help fight the Iroquois. The French also allowed for the trading of firearms and gunpowder to their native allies. In January of 1666, the French attempted to invade the Mohawk homeland, the Mohawk being one of the more powerful tribes in the Iroquois Confederacy. They failed because it was too chilly outside. But they tried again in September of 1666, when it was slightly warmer out. They arrived in the Mohawk homeland in October of that year, and nobody was there. But they were, so as an act of retaliation for the attacks that had been happening on the French and their native allies, they burned down all the villages they came across and destroyed the farmland. At the same time the French started making these aggressive military moves towards the Iroquois, they realized they had another problem. The English. The French and Dutch had been on the continent for trade, but the English were there for a different reason. They were there for land. By this point in time, the 1670s, the population of French settlers on the continent had swelled all the way up to 6,700. Wow. At this same point in time, the English population had swelled up to 120,000. The French freaked the fuck out. They started laying claim to lands all over the place and building little trading posts and settlements just so they could stake their claim before the English got there. The Iroquois did not like this. The Iroquois would attack these settlements to maintain trade dominance as they progressed into the area, primarily modern-day Indiana and Illinois. At the time, this area was home primarily to the Miami and Illinois tribes. As a direct counter to these Iroquois attacks on French settlements, and to help protect French interests in the areas held by the Miami and Illinois tribes, they began supplying the Miami and Illinois with firearms. The French had basically lost all control of the fur trade to the Iroquois. 
They would attempt to attack the Iroquois to push them back out of these areas that the Iroquois had taken over. Sometimes they would succeed, sometimes they would fail. The Iroquois would retaliate by attacking a French settlement. The cycle repeats. The relationship between the French and Iroquois did soften up a little bit at this time, though, primarily because the French were so screwed when it came to the fur trade. Meanwhile, in Europe, some bullshit was going on. A war or something between somebody and somebody else. Who gives a shit? Not me, it's in Europe, I don't care. But as a result, the New Englanders asked the Iroquois to stop trading with the French. Since the Iroquois had been allied to the English for so long and they were a much juicier trade partner than the French, who they had been fighting for decades at this point in time, the Iroquois said, okay, and stopped trading with the French. Because of this disruption in trade, along with a billion other convoluted reasons, including that bulk war in Europe I just mentioned a moment ago, an event which would come to be known as King William's War began. The war was between the French and their native allies and the English and their native allies. It would last for a few years over the course of multiple battles and some pretty horrific events, but eventually a peaceful agreement would be reached. For a, for a very short period of time, there would be peace. Now the treaty wasn't just signed by the English and French. It also included many of the leaders of the tribes who were allied to either side. And the terms applied to both the Europeans and the natives. So, for a brief point in time, the French and Iroquois were now at peace. And during this brief moment of peace, the French turned to the Iroquois and said, so what are we going to do about these beavers? To which the Iroquois looked around at all the land they had conquered and said, the what? Oh yeah, that's what all this was about. And then the Iroquois looked south to the English colony of Pennsylvania, which had been established just a few short years prior in 1681 and was getting uncomfortably close to Iroquois land. Who did the English think they were, encroaching on Iroquois land that the Iroquois had earned fair and square by committing a genocide of the Erie people just a few decades prior? I'm not saying two wrongs makes a right, but pot calling the kettle black, if you ask me. The Iroquois and the French both realized that the biggest threat to them was the English. So in 1701 in Montreal, a peace treaty was signed between the French and the Iroquois, separate from the peace treaty that involved the English, thus bringing the Beaver Wars to an end. Then everyone lived happily ever after and nothing bad happened ever again. The Beaver Wars set the foundation for intertribal and intercontinental relations on North America for decades to come. They almost directly set the basis for the French and Indian Wars, which in turn played a large part in putting the wheels in motion that would eventually lead to the American Revolution. When you take a look at these events in this point in time with any sense of context or nuance, you very quickly realize it was an incredibly complicated intermixture of geopolitics and economics that shifted the course of the nation that was to come. Also, if I look different, uh, that's because I realized like half of the lights on my set have been off this entire time. This was not my fault, the fuse popped. I mean, all right, I'm just trying to make up excuses. I should have noticed, but this is what it should have looked like the whole time. Isn't it great? Wouldn't it have been amazing if I'd done that the entire time? But I'm not doing it over and you're still here, so let's go. Now, some people use the actions of the Iroquois as some sort of justification for some of the things the English colonists did to Native Americans later on. Um, and a lot of the things I read and saw frame this whole thing as some sort of like socialist propaganda, as if, you know, the Iroquois were these peaceful native people in touch with nature until the evils of capitalism swayed them. Both of those beliefs are f***ing And also the second one's kind of racist. The native people in North America when the Europeans arrived weren't some monolithic group of brutish savages. They also weren't a monolithic group of barefoot hippies walking through the woods painting with the colors of the wind. They were hundreds of unique groups of human beings with their own unique customs and religions and languages and practices and beliefs. 
There were complex and unique geopolitical and socioeconomic relationships. There were times of war. There were times of peace. Some people sucked and some people didn't suck because they're people and these are the things people do and have been doing since the dawn of time, no matter where in the world or what color their skin is. At this point in time, the Iroquois had been working in their own self-interest. How dare they? As had the French and the Dutch and the English. That's what groups of people do. They look out for themselves. It is what it is. That's history for you. It's complicated and sometimes it's messy. And oh my gosh, oh, you have to apply nuance to it sometimes. Oh, I hate that. I love when you can just say something that's simple and doesn't require you to think about it. Oh my God. But seriously, so much of what I came across while researching this topic, a topic which I thought would be interesting, approaches the subject from this weird perspective that I think people who have this perspective believe they're well-intended, but to me just comes off as like weird and racist, where they'll approach the subject as if the Iroquois were a group of people who were being acted upon by outside influence, as if they had no personal agency and they made none of the decisions in any of this, which is weird. Just a weird thing to think, in my opinion. I don't know, maybe I'm crazy, who cares? History is made by human beings, human beings living their lives. Human beings can be good or they can be bad. Sometimes they can be both and sometimes they can be neither. It's complicated, life's complicated. Sometimes life's messy. And sometimes in history, there isn't necessarily a good guy or a bad guy. It doesn't have to be that way. But let me know in the comments who you think the good guys and who you think the bad guys are. Yeah, the comments for this one are gonna be fun. It's very easy to simplify history, to condense everything down and place everyone into a convenient little box, which is fine sometimes, but realize that in doing so, you're stripping away the humanity of the individuals who made that history. I've been King Trout, and as always, thank you for watching.